When I give talks like this, um, I just stick up some generic title that allows me to say anything because I can never figure out what I want to talk about. And in fact, I'm not going to actually give you one long, boring talk for an hour. I'm going to give you three short, boring talks for an hour. So that way, hopefully one of them will be less boring than the other two. That's, that's my theory. Um, the first one I'm going to do is talk a bit about what I call the essence and, uh, of agile software development. It sounds a bit odd to be still talking about agile software development so long after the manifesto was written and now it's become kind of mainstream in many ways. But I do think it's important to talk about because it's often something that's not um, properly understood or used very well. I often talk about people who are talking about, oh yeah, we're using agile software development at XYZ place and um, they talk about what they're doing and I think, what on earth has this got any connection to anything I understand as agile? And I, I like to think I know something about Agile software development. So I like to reiterate, reiterate what I see as the essential qualities of it, um, as well as talk about fluency. And, and there's an interesting model called the Agile Fluency Model that helps, I think, think about how um, Agile software works. But before we get to that, I'll focus on the essence. And I, I've always, I'm, I'm quite a history buff. I quite enjoy reading stuff about history. And I think it's important to understand where something is to understand how it got there. And so to understand about the essence of Agile, I think you have to sort of go back um, to where it really started, was back in the 90s, in a world where software projects were <coughs> universally, almost universally seen as going very wrong. I mean, it doesn't mean that software projects don't go wrong now. They do. Um, but Certainly my feel was that it was a good bit worse then. And there was certainly a lot more sense of there's little value in, in software because it goes wrong so often. But there was also a very strong view that we knew what the answer was for these problems in software development. And these approach was uh, things that I refer to as plan-driven software processes. Um, big methodologies that tell, laid out in great detail exactly the various steps you should follow in order to um, build software. And if you took one of these things and you faithfully followed it the way that it said it was supposed to be, that would lead you um, to a successful project. And the view at the time, the mainstream view I would say, was this was the future. This was how software development ought to be done. And that if you weren't doing something like this, you were clearly unprofessional uh, and doing it wrong. But also in the 90s, there were a bunch of people who were experimenting with a very different approach, um, who very much rejected that view, not necessarily saying it was wrong for all software projects, but saying that there was a significant amount of software projects where that plan-driven approach wasn't appropriate. And this is where the heart of the, of the agile um, movement came from. Now, even before the event when we wrote the manifesto, um, which is what's uh, um, indicated up there, I was involved in the 90s in one of these kind of groups. Um, I was involved in the early days of extreme programming. I worked with Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries on what's re often referred to as the birth extreme programming project. And I very much liked a lot of what I saw with the agile approach. But I also heard similar but different things from other people, the Scrum people, um, people doing feature-driven development. And I thought, well, is there some commonality amongst all of this? And that led me to writing an essay that's still a popular essay on my website, where I kind of distilled all of this thinking and tried to say, OK, how, how does it make sense to me? A lot of the time when I write things on my website, it's because I start off not really understanding something, and I write the article in order to make myself understand it. Um, and that's a very useful technique generally in writing. But as a result of this, I contrasted the, this thinking that we now call agile, it wasn't called agile at the time I wrote it, but um, that's obviously the term we use now, with this plan-driven approach. And I saw two primary differences, two areas where I felt there was a really big difference between the two. And agile is in many ways a reaction to this plan-driven vision. 
So it, it's useful to, to think of it in terms of this um, contrast. And the first of these is the attitude that we take towards the planning process. So let's begin with the kind of the, um, the plan-driven notion of planning. It was, I like to think of it as very much inspired by how people, at least how people perceive that buildings are built or bridges are built. It's an engineering notion. And they look at that and say, well, what happens if you're going to build a bridge or build a building? Well, first you get a bunch of professional engineers who lay out the design of the thing you're going to build, the bridge. They figure out what supports, where they need to go, the materials, all the rest of it. Figure that all out. They also figure out how it should be built, you know, when people should come at what times, all of that. Come up with a detailed plan, both the design of the bridge and the plan for building it. And then they go off, and a much larger, more expensive uh, in the whole group actually goes and builds it. And so that notion of a separation, that you have a plan, and then you, f you figure everything out, and then a group of relatively unthinking people, that's a bit um, crude, but that's um, the notion at least, will actually then execute that plan and follow it out and produce the product. I think of this as a kind of a predictive planning notion because what you're doing with the plan is you're coming up with a prediction of how things will work. And if you get it right, if you do your job well, then things went according to plan. And that is, in fact, the criteria of success in much of this plan-driven thinking. And, in fact, in much of what software development, even now, even in agile world, I hear people say, oh, yes, we were a successful project because we were on time and on budget. But that's a predictive planning mindset. If you think of success and on time and on budget, that's actually rather at odds with agile thinking. Now, the reason that people went this route is because they said, well, it works very well for buildings. It works very well for bridges. It is the engineering way of doing things. It is the proper way of doing things. But it had a number of flaws. The biggest flaw is in order to be able to build something in this kind of way and come up with this kind of detailed plan, you need to know what it is you're going to build. And you need to have that known to a fair degree of accuracy. And if you're building a building, I mean, you can imagine, yes, you, you know roughly how big you want it, you know how many floors, etc., that kind of thing. You can get that kind of, of knowledge. But the question is, you know, how does this work in software? Because if the plan requires you to be de de to have these stable requirements, and the plan is everything, that means the entire software process is determined on having those stable requirements. And that, of course, is the big question mark. And as I always like to ask, how many people in this room have been on a software project where there's been significant changes in the requirements during the course of the project? <laughs> exactly. Pretty much everybody sticks their hands up. Because the problem is, requirements are hard, very hard to stabilize. Now, the plan-driven people recognize this. They say it's important we get rid of requirements churn. And we have to go through this stabilizing. And we go through lots of exercises in order to try and reduce that change. But the change is seen as the big problem, and we need to stabilize to prevent it. Now, the Agile mindset looked at this problem from a different angle. It said, well, what we have here is a very awkward dependency. So what should we do? Well, let's figure out if we can break the dependency. Let's come up with a software process that assumes requirements are going to be unstable, assumes there's no way we're going to be able to stabilize them, but can at least control the effects of the change. So a lot of agile planning practices, the notion of building iterations and things of that kind is based on the notion that change is inevitable. We have to embrace change, as Kent Beck put it. But we should do so in a controlled way. So that every time a change comes up, we, have, we still do a lot of planning. We have a plan. But we take the change. We look at the plan. We use the plan to help us decide what the consequences of the change are. And then we say, OK, what do we do about it? Do we reject the change? Do we keep the change? Do we make something? The plan becomes a, is a constantly evolving way of figuring out what change means. A uh, project manager once said to me, um, a project plan is rather like a lettuce. It looks really good the day you get it. After a few days, it looks a bit wilty around the edges. 
and after a month or so, it's unrecognizable. And that's the attitude that um, agile thinking brings into planning. And in fact, it goes even further than that. And I love this phrase because it brings out the fact that in an agile world, oh, you can't see the bottom of the screen at the back. Yeah, that's a pain, isn't it? Um, it really gives you a plus when you can make changes late on because you can react faster um, to what's going on. And so hence you see more sophisticated agile teams focusing a lot on things like cycle time that says we're able to change things very fast. Now, of course, this makes success a lot more complicated to measure. Success is no longer going, uh, going according to plan because the plan changes every week. How can you base success on that? Instead, you have to base success on things like business value and are we actually improving what we're trying to do, in, uh, what our uh, domain is trying to do in what it acts. You know, are we more efficient as a whole? And that's harder to, to picture, harder to measure, and it also isn't purely the software developer's responsibility. It's the responsibility of everybody involved in the organization. So it's harder to point fingers around. Um, and that makes it a lot harder. But it's still true that if you measure success based on on time and on budget, you're missing the key point of what Agile is about. So I think of this as an adaptive planning approach because we're constantly adapting our plan as we learn more information and as we make progress. So the second aspect um, really goes back to this notion of where did this engineering, we come up with a plan that other people follow, um, starts with. And a lot of it starts with this guy. Anybody recognize who it is? It's got to be some agile folks in the audience who have uh, learnt the rap picture. Anyone? Nobody? This is actually one of the most influential people in society in the 20th and 21st century. I mean, we may know of famous politicians like you know, Churchill and Gandhi and all the rest of it, but they have far less effect on the way we have, we have our daily lives than this guy. This guy, Frederick Taylor, is, uh, he was an, a sort of entrepreneur, industrialist in America in the late, latter half of the 19th century. Um, he came up with a bunch of things, um, including um, a form of steel that is, was a big step forwards in terms of quality of drills and things of that kind. But the thing that he's most known for is what's referred often to as scientific management. And the idea was that when Taylor started in, in the factories in, in Pennsylvania, um, people would say, oh, I need to build something like this. And the, the, the people who would actually build it, who did the work, would figure out how to do it. Um, and what Taylor said, well, this is completely wrong because these people, they're stupid, they're lazy, we don't want them figuring this stuff out. Instead, you have professional planners who figure out exactly how it's to be done, exactly how, what cuts to make, exactly how people should move their arms, and that kind of thing, very detailed, and then the people just follow that. The phrase that he's well known for is, in the past, the person was first. In the future, the system must be first. And so a lot of what we see in things like the manufacturing production lines and the manufacturing of the 20th century is very much based on his ideas. Whenever you have a separate planning department, decides how another group of people should do his work. And this notion was very much part of the software engineering methodologies. They would say, oh, we come up with a methodology that has certain steps to be carried out in a certain order with dependencies and whatever. And then we say, as part of our methodology, we also say we need certain kinds of people. You know, we need four developers, three analysts, two QAs, and a project manager in a pear tree. Then, once we found the people of this type, we just slot them into the roles, and everything happens like that. And the people just do what they're told as their process. <coughs> now, the agile approach, surprise, surprise, takes a very, very different view to this. It says that we, we don't know enough, even if we think this kind of mechanistic approach might work in manufacturing, which, by the way, it's pretty much been rejected in the late 20th century anyway um, in manufacturing. It absolutely doesn't work in software because the people involved in software, I mean, in order to write software, you have to be pretty bright and pretty capable. Um, so it's really up to the teams to figure out how they should work. 
So the point here is that every team should come up with a process that works for them. Because different problems are different, so require different processes. Different people are different. Different people work in different ways. People don't shoehorn themselves into developer, QA, GUI designer kind of roles. They have different strengths and weaknesses. And each team has to decide what approach is going to work best for them. Which may, of course, mean they choose not to work in an agile fashion. And that's actually OK. Well, it's certainly more OK than imposing an agile work practice on um, a team that doesn't want to work that way. And so as a result, you look at a whole bunch of agile teams, they'll be working in different processes. And again, this causes problems. I hear people saying, oh, we have a standard agile approach. We're going to roll out enterprise wide. Eh, no, sorry. Even things like, we're going to have standard way of measuring story points so that we can compare velocities and efficiencies of teams. Eh, thank you for playing. That's not agile. It's very important that the teams decide how they work, and also that they change that definition as they go on. So any team that's working in this kind of way, these, plan, these processes will change over time. As people learn better about what works for them, as the circumstances of the project change, so that's why retrospectives are such a vital part of an agile practice, because they're a part of saying, how do we learn from what we're doing, and how do we improve on what we're doing? So that's how I see the fundamental differences between the plan-driven mindset and the agile mindset. And you'll notice that these differences aren't necessarily about techniques. They're not about whether you're doing pair programming or retrospectives or iter even iterations. But they're very fundamental to your point of view of the world. And that's the hardest part of the Agile shift for most organizations and why most people who pay lip service to Agile aren't actually doing it. It's because it involves a, a very strong cultural and worldview change. And that's actually much, much bigger than um, most people realize. So if that's the essence, I want to talk a little bit about this fluency model. And there's been a lot of frustration in Agile circles about people sort of taking the name and cargo culting Agile approaches and trying to think about how to deal with that. And two people who came up with a, an interesting way of thinking about it are Diana Larson and James Shaw. They've been in the Agile community since the very beginning. And they came up with a couple of years ago with this Agile fluency model, which, I, uh, which fortunately they let me publish on my website. And it basically has four main stages to it. It's kind of like a maturity model, but not really, because it's not really something you should use as a way of assessing where you are but more a way of assessing what level do we think we can reasonably reach um, within our organization. So that the first star point focuses very much on the management side of things. So here we see things like sprints and backlogs and Kanban boards and very much stuff focused on the management side. It's the classic kind of stuff you'll see with many organizations taking on Scrum or taking on Kanban in this kind of style. And with this, you get some definite um, benefits from it. I mean, you get a greater degree of visibility as to what is going on, who is doing what, who is building what when. Because again, as you shrink down your building in terms of small iterations, you're building story by story, you can begin to see what's happening. As one of our early clients thought, said, um, in our early journey into Agile, now I understand what I'm getting for when I sign the check every month. And that's a very important thing. Um, it also gives you at least some ability to change your mind and begin to have some of that adaptivity that I talked about earlier on. Most teams that they saw that were doing Agile at all, um, and not purely lip service, they said about just under half of them were at this kind of level. And it takes a while to get there, several months for those at the back. Um, but you know, it, it's not a huge amount of distance. But the problem is this only gives you a certain amount. It gives you the visibility, but it doesn't give you that much ability to really uh, make that kind of be able to change. You can begin to see that you need to make changes, but you don't necessarily are actually able to execute on it properly. In order to get past to do that, You've got to get past the management practices and also introduce the technical side. 
And now we talk about the kind of stuff like test-driven development and continuous delivery and things of this kind. These are very much technical practices. These are things to make the software more healthy and more capable of working. There are also a lot of the things that came through from extreme programming. Um, and this is why I, I, pick, I think have a resonance, because I always like the fact that extreme programming of these early methodologies really combined the technical and the management stuff together in a way that, say, Scrum um, doesn't. Now, with this approach, um, the big, great thing is now you can begin to get the l higher productivity that um, can really come from this. Teams can move a lot faster. Because they can move a lot faster, they can also change direction much more quickly. So you begin to have the real benefit of the adaptive planning stuff. You can now change your mind more, uh, better. Another very interesting thing is you tend to get low defects. One of the constant things I hear when I sort of listen to a, a team that has gone in and, and done work with Agile, mostly ThoughtWorks teams, because that's who I spend a lot of time with, but also outside of that, is dramatic drops in defect rates. Um, order of magnitude drops in defect rates are normal um, when you introduce Agile into an organization. Um, and, that's, and that's part, of course, why the productivity is higher, because you're not fighting defects all the time. But there is a significant amount of investment, and it takes a significant amount of time. So their view is from a matter of months to even a few years to actually get to be at the point where you can, you're doing this well. And during that time, you may find your productivity is actually lowered because you're learning new skills. This is why this is a much harder um, state to achieve. They saw in the Agile teams, they saw about a third of them are actually operating at this level. And the shift is really because at the, to get that first move is a culture shift. And that's important. And it has its own difficulties within the team. But within a team, it's not so bad. But to actually shift to the second level, you need the skills shift. Now, an important point here is though, although you'll almost certainly reach the first stage before the second stage because of the time it takes to learn the technical skills, you should decide at the beginning which way you're going to, how far you intend to go. Because if you want to get to that second level, you've got to start learning the technical practices right at the beginning. Now, the third level is a much rarer level. 5%, they said, of teams actually reaching there. Um, and it really it gets to the point where you're making a much bigger organizational change. And you're beginning to say across a whole organization, what, how do we operate in an agile way? If this is the point where teams begin to say, we're going to actually not just the, take the notion of we're building stuff as, to some extent, directed by a business. But we're actually going to decide what are the necessary things we should be building. How should we divide up the teams themselves? So it's a much wider scoped exercise, much harder to achieve. And we're definitely talking multiple years um, to reach this point, as well as it's a much harder journey to get there. There's relatively few cases I've heard of where, where somebody's actually reached this point. And their fourth star level is primarily um, speculative. Um, it's where they see where a t a f the three star level would go even further. Um, and so I don't sort of want to talk too much about that. The key thing to realize is you know, this is a multi-step approach. And it's an approach that takes time and investment to reach. Um, if you're thinking, I mean, I remember somebody coming into me and saying, oh, we're going to take this big uh, enterprise. We're going to turn it all agile. And we're going to do that in six months. Um, my consulting skills kind of failed me because I, you know, I just couldn't stop laughing. And he took offense at that. But the reality is it doesn't go that fast. This kind of stuff does take a while to achieve. <coughs> um, for more on this, the new methodology article, the Agile Fluency article above on my um, site. And that's the first talk.